Right, Teleodia champs and the Microsoft Surface event has happened and wharf, we have some new Microsoft products and they are really good and we're going to talk about those products in this video, especially the Surface Pro 8. I'm going to get into the minutiae of that product and you know, help you with this sort of buyer's guide because I don't want you to make any mistakes buying that product. So I'm going to explain everything about the product to see whether it's for you or not. And of course they have the Surface Studio laptop which doesn't come out until next year. But just quickly on that Surface Studio laptop, I will cover it in more depth when it actually comes out because it's coming out early next year, as I said, but pretty awesome, right? 14.4 inch display with pixel flow, of course. You get to use the new pen. So that's the Surface Slim Pen 2. And you actually have to buy that as an accessory too. It's good resolution, 1600p there. You can see 120 hertz. I'll talk about the hertz order refresh rate in a second. But what's interesting here is it has the 35 watt parts. Okay, so this is sort of in between the Ultrabook parts. So the 1165 or 1185 G7 and the, you know, the H part that goes in gaming laptops or XPS 15s or something like that. So it is four core still but uses more wattage than the Ultrabook parts. I guess it is a balance, right? 35 watts versus 15 watts, which you'll get with the Ultrabook parts. And it's a bit less than 45 watts, which you get with the, you know, the gaming laptops. I'm sort of thinking, why just not put the Ultrabook parts and, you know, they can configure to, you know, 30 watts and above anyway. So up to 32 gigs RAM. It is a little bit heavy there. You can see the i7 model needs more cooling, of course and it's four pounds and 3.8 pounds for the i5. Now, well, when you think about it, you know, usually 15 inch laptops start at about four pounds. It's a little bit less than that, but it is on the heavier side for an Ultrabook. And of course we get Nvidia graphics. So RTX 3050 Ti, which is no slouch. It's actually not too bad, but it all depends on the wattage of it, of course. And of course we get Thunderbolt. Yes, Thunderbolt 4. So that is awesome. It also has the Surface Connect as well. So you'll be able to charge it with the Surface Connect port or, you know, USB-C because Thunderbolt does include charging. Well, Thunderbolt 4 does include charging there. So yeah, more about this when it comes out next year. One thing to note here, Wi-Fi 6, no Wi-Fi 6E. It looks like a good product. One thing I will say about this laptop, 100% for sure, if you're not going to use these sort of, you know, studio modes like to write on and stuff like that or pushing the screen forward, if you're not going to use those modes, don't bother getting this because you'll be able to get something cheaper, just as premium, although the 120 hertz display is sort of unique for an Ultrabook. Let's go to the Surface Pro 8. Let's get into the minutiae of this product. Now, first thing is up to 120 hertz refresh. So it is 60 hertz by default. So that means no variable refresh rate. I would have thought with Windows 11 and you know Microsoft building the hardware and the software, we could add something like that variable refresh rate. So it just you know knows what you're doing and cranks up the refresh rate when you need it, like using a pen or playing games or whatever. But no. It's sort of, you're going to have to manually change it yourself. Now, here's an important thing. 60 hertz default. So when they talk about this 16 hours battery life, which it says up to 16 hours battery life there, you, you know, Microsoft are pretty genuine with their battery life. You would be able to get that if you crank down the, you know, the brightness or whatever. Expect to lose quite a lot of hours of that battery life once you enable 120 hertz. But a nice resolution there, three by two, perfect. I love that, you know, sort of aspect ratio. And we're talking, you know, a 1920p sort of display. Up to 32 gigs RAM, LPDDR4X, which means it's the fast RAM. Now here are the two processors. Now the thing is here, in one sense, I would say just get the i5. You're not going to notice the difference from the i7. I'll tell you the differences in a sec. But the reality is, if you want 16 gigs RAM, you're going to have to go to the i7 anyway. So that's just how it is. Now the differences between these two CPUs. So we have the 1135G7, the i5 on the left, and the i7 on the right, which is 1185G7. So they haven't skimped with that i7. That is the best i7 you can get. Now, the big difference here is obviously clock speeds up to 4.2 gigahertz on the i5 and with the i7, 4.8 gigahertz. This is all going to be governed by thermals. Now, the cooling solution with the i5 and i7 is the same now. So you're not going to buy an i5 that's fanless. But at the end of the day, this clock speed is really down to thermals, how fast it's going to, you know, boost. The i5 will boost if the thermals are good, pretty much the same as the i7, right? But there is a big difference in the cache. 
So you have 12 megabytes of smart cache with the i7 and eight megabytes of smart cache with the i5. Cache can make a huge amount of difference and that's a big difference there, that's four megabytes and that can make a huge amount of difference if your application you know, uses the cache, it is better to have more cache. Now one other difference is the GPU as well. If we have a look at the GPU, we have a difference in clock speed, 1.3 gigahertz with the i5, 1.35 gigahertz with the i7, but more importantly is the execution units, 96 versus 80 on the i5, okay? So 96 on the i7. So there is a bit of a difference in graphics, cache and boost clock. And also if you have a look here, it says with IPU, the i7 has the IPU, which I think is some sort of uh, enterprise -y sort of thing. So maybe for work you want the i7. But the reality is if you want anything more than eight gigabytes of RAM, you're gonna to have to get the i7 anyway. So it's sort of superfluous talking about that. Look how light these are. Look, 889 grams or less than two pounds. Now, of course, that's with no keyboard, but that is super light, super mobile, super compact. It really is like carrying around an iPad sort of thing rather than a laptop. If we have a look at the product now, we are actually missing the SD card reader. So if I have a look around this product, um, you can see there we still have the surface slot there. So that slot there, the surface connect. We have two thunderbolts and the power there it looks like. And then if we go around the other side, we have the volume rocker and then we also have the headphone jack. But I cannot see for the life of me any SD card. So I think they've got rid of the mini SD card reader. Bit unfortunate, but that's just how it is. Also, removable SSD, so you'll be able to upgrade this SSD. It will be one of those small SSDs, so they're pretty niche, those sort of things. It won't be the full-size SSD, but you can change it yourself, the storage, so don't worry about what storage you get. The main consideration is really the memory, the RAM. Now, if you're just doing basic stuff, 8 gigs of RAM in the i5 is perfectly fine, so, you know, productivity, Word, Excel, just, you know, viewing content, web surfing, all that sort of stuff, eight gigs will be fine. If you're gonna do any creative work, I suggest you do get 16 gigs, which means you have to get the i7. And I guess the power users, yes, get 32, but I think 16 gigs is the sweet spot there with the i7. Perfect, and because you have Thunderbolt 4, we have Thunderbolt 4 with these, awesome. That means you can connect eGPU, fast storage, 10 gig network, and all that sort of stuff. But you can also play AAA games now when you connect an eGPU. It does open up a whole new world of, you know, Thunderbolt docks. It's just awesome that it has it. And remember people saying, oh, the reason Microsoft doesn't have Thunderbolt is because of security. Well, you were wrong. Because Thunderbolt 4 is just Thunderbolt 3 with every feature implemented, including the DMA, you know, the memory protection there which is on by default with Thunderbolt 4, which is what people were talking about security wise, but that was just a load of rubbish. Microsoft have now come to the party and I guess they wanted to keep the Surface Pro at a lower price point when they had no Thunderbolt because obviously including Thunderbolt makes laptops more expensive. So now they're not cheaping out and they come in at a good price. They're very competitive. I think that's pretty much all you need to know about these products. I will get one in and make sure you subscribe or connect it to an eGPU and we'll just do a normal gaming test without an eGPU as well. And it does come out October the 5th when Windows 11 comes out, of course. But I would wait to buy one of these when Microsoft has one of those 20%, 15, 20% discounts and then you'll get, you know, a good spec Surface Pro at a really good price. Actually, they're pretty good price anyway. So yeah, catch you in the next one, guys. Tally ho.